Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Coming in slightly late, if we just had a fire practice. Um, this is the webinar in the Knowledge Miles series, part of the Lord Mayor's Lectures on behalf of Professor Michael Minelli, whose theme for his mayoral year is Connect to Prosper. In this free online lecture series, we address the connections in and around the square mile, which Michael likes to call the uh, world's coffee house. And Professor Tim Connell, Chairman of the Gresham Society and a Fellow of Gresham College here in the City of London. I'll be convening this session and moderating the questions and answers afterwards. So we have a plan today. And uh, this is all fairly straightforward. Introduction followed by the key lecture from Bob McDowell, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. Now we have a really interesting, a slightly curious topic today on Lord Chancellor Jeffreys, a revisionist view of his role and cases as common sergeant on record with the City of London. Now it might feel rather odd that in a series which projects in the future of the City of London, that we're going back to the 17th century. But in fact, we'll find as we go through that there are lessons to be learned, as they say, about the uh, modern world. Now we're delighted to have Bob McDowell with us today. He's a big city man with a background in law and finance. He's a liveryman and former court assistant of the Tin Plate Workers Company and a member of the Gresham Society. Bob, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about yourself and then tell us more about why Judge Jeffries is a key historical figure and rather more complex than we think of him today. Yes, many thanks indeed, uh, Tim. Um, I think first of all, actually, I'd like to thank my livery company, the Worshipful Company of Tim Plate Alias Wire Workers, for kindly sponsoring the lecture and indeed the Gresham Society through yourself for kindly hosting this series. And interestingly enough, the Tim Plate Workers received its charter during this immediate restoration period. Um, let me uh, briefly, the, the agenda's up, so I'm going to give a brief biography of Lord Jeffreys, some interesting background to the lecture, uh, comment about the Whig view of history and Lord Jeffreys, uh, focus quite a bit on uh, Professor Keaton's book, Lord Jeffreys and the Stuart Cause, which uh, was quite controversial when it was published in 1965. I'll talk briefly about Lord Jeffreys' role and cases as uh, both Sergeant Recorder of the City of London, and then I'll make some uh, concluding uh, remarks. Um, before I move to the next slide, uh, much has been written about George Jeffreys in almost 350 years since his death. <clears throat> most of it's unflattering, as most of you will know. His portrayal in films, theatre and television has been equally condemnatory. I hope this lecture, briefly ass assisted by the meticulously researched by the late Professor George Keaton, who incidentally was head of the law faculty at University College London while I was an undergraduate there. Um, to quote George Keaton, all the most important events in George Jeffrey's life occurred after his death. Jeffrey's life is in reality one of uh, the persons whose career and character have been replaced by legend and folklore. And I should know that because I was president of the Folklore Society for three years. And it's only in the 20th century that this myth of Jeffrey's has been partly exploded. Uh, next slide. Um, I think it's important to talk briefly about his George Jeffrey's background and uh, his phenomenal rise to power. Um, he was born in 1645 at Acton Hall, which is on the slide in front of you. Um, his uh, father and his grandfather had been uh, uh, engaged in the law, and his, his father was actually a royalist during the English Civil War, but was reconciled to the Commonwealth and in fact served as High Sheriff of Denbigh uh, in, uh, in, in the mid-1650s. His brothers were of note. Uh, Thomas, uh, later Sir Thomas, was an English consul in Spain. Uh, one of his other uh, uh, brothers was a vicar of Holt near Wrexham. And his youngest brother uh, had a good ecclesiastical career, becoming vice dean of Canterbury in 1685. Uh, Je George Jeffreys was educated successively at Shrewsbury School, St Paul's School in London, and Westminster School, and he became an undergraduate at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1662, but left after one year and decided to read for the bar, entering the Inner Temple in 1653. He embarked on a legal career 
1668, becoming a common sergeant phenomenally early in 1671 at the age of 26. And he was aiming to be the for the post of recorder of London, but was passed over for this in 1676 in favour of William Dolbin. He turned instead to the court and he became Solicitor General to the Duke of York, who became uh, James II, uh, very, as many of you will know, the younger brother of Charles II. Uh, despite his Protestant upbringing, he found favour under the Roman Catholic Duke, uh, Duke uh, of York. He was knighted in 1677, became recorder of the City of London in 1678 when Dolben retired, uh, and became Lord Chief Justice of uh, Chester and the uh, Council for the Crown in uh, Ludlow in 1680. Uh, Charles I created him a baron in 1681. Two years later, at the phenomenally early age of 38, he became Chief Justice of the King's Bench and a member of the Privy Council. And uh, in two years later, when following James II's accession to the throne in 1685, he became Lord Chancellor and was given a peerage as Baron Geoffrey of Wem, again at the phenomenally early age of 40. I think it's important to give a little context to the background of this lecture. As I said, Lord Jeffreys' association with the city came through his roles as common sergeant in 1671 and later recorder of London from 1678 to 1680. And within the time constraints, I shall briefly talk about his role and some of the cases he participated in in those roles. But perhaps the most important element of this is Professor Keaton's book, Lord Je Chancellor Jeffreys of the Stuart Cause, which was published in, 18, in 1965, as I said, and it was controversial at the time because in addition to its meticulously uh, uh, detailed research, the book challenged the Whig view of English history on which so much uh, many of us were nurtured at school and at university. And I shall discuss this later in this series. The other very interesting thing that emerged from uh, George Keaton's research was that um, the cross-referencing of documentation revealed that a number of documents had disappeared. And this gives rise to a conjecture on his part as to whether those who uh, turned sides that the Glorious Revolution had uh, removed certain documentation to protect themselves, or whether it was uh, a case which is still true that government likes to write its own history. But that's a matter of conjecture. Um, let me, I think it's important just to talk about the Whig uh, view of history or Whig historiography. And it's an approach that presents history generally as a journey from an oppressive and benighted past to a glorious present. The present described generally, generally one of modern form of liberal democracy and constitutional monarchy. And it was originally a satirical term for patriotic grand narratives praising Britain's adoption of the constitutional monarchy and the historic development of the Westminster parliamentary system. But, but, but this has, term has been applied uh, more widely and um, uh, it, it has also been very much embedded in uh, a lot of the uh, history of the 19th century, epitomised particularly by uh, people like uh, Lord Macaulay and uh, a, a Lord Chancellor, Lord Campbell, who were uh, long, long, uh, long forgotten, thank goodness, who wrote a, a ten volume history of the uh, of, of the roles of Lord Chancellors from beginning to uh, uh, Victorian times. And both, of, both Macaulay and Campbell draw very much on the folklore of uh, of, of uh, Lord, Lord Jeffreys much of which comes from the uh, pamphlet, pamphleteers of the time uh, of the Restoration, uh, jo uh, John Dutton and uh, Titus Oates being uh, prime examples. Um, let me talk a little bit, uh, and I, I won't, certainly won't be able to do it justice in the time, but let me talk about four or five of, I think, the key pieces of which, which emerge from George Keaton's excellent book. Um, I think, first of all, while the restoration of the monarch after the turbulence, drudgery, and what some described to me as the Taliban years of the Commonwealth, uh, it was a fairly peaceful um, transition. But uh, there, were, there were still underlying tensions. 
And the monarch was extremely aware and attuned to noises and events which could destabilize the institution. And that is a very important background to, uh, to Jeffreys. And also the role of the judiciary. And this is, again, extremely important. You do judiciary were the monarch's servants, appointed and paid by the monarch. As such, they were regarded as a branch of the royal administration, perhaps almost as civil servants are regarded today as agents of royal policy. And in spite of the considerable independence in interpretation of the law, they were, as an order, subject to bitter attacks, especially by Whig pamphleteers, on whose record the likes of Macaulay and Victorian Lord Chancellor Campbell relied too much for their so-called historical writings. Assessment of Lord Jeffrey's technical competence as an advocate and a judge uh, were also important as part of uh, George Keaton's book. Um, he, as a lawyer, he was particularly remembered by equity lawyers laying down equity principles which overrode the common law. And I, I won't go into the details, but there was the Duke of Norfolk case, Lord Nottingham's case, uh, Baden versus the Earl and Countess of Pembroke, which were actually significant legal precedents. George Jeffreys was also uh, praised by Sir Matthew Hale, who is still remembered in legal circles as a judge of high reputation and whose recommendation went a long way to Jeffrey's appointment as common sergeant of, this, of the city of London. Uh, and the 20th century, in addition to George Keaton books, there are a number of books in the 20th century which uh, examine the contemporary source material about Lord Jeffreys and painted, I think, a more objective view of his legal competence. Notably a book by Lord Birkenhead, the Lord Chancellor in the 1920s, himself no stranger to the bottle, um, and also Montgomery Hyde in the 1940s, who gives, who was a professional legal biographer, who give credence to his legal competence as well as his prodigious appetite for and ability to handle a heavy caseload. And finally, uh, uh, George Keaton dispelled, dispelled some uh, of the distortion of aspects of Lord Jeffrey's life, his private life, his uh, his uh, alleged drinking, relationship with his second wife, wealth of the family, his health and personal habits, which were all set out and cribbed from wood pamphleteers. I suppose much in the way, main ways the modern red tops portray their own prey today. Let me go on to talk uh, briefly about Lord Jeffrey's role as uh, Sergeant of the City of London. As I say, he was elected as common sergeant in, at the age of 26. And the common sergeant was the second most important legal position in the city of London after that of the recorder of the city of London. His election was attributed to strong connections, the support of Sir Matthew Hale, whom I mentioned the Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench, was helpful. But professional standing and legal and advocacy competence were necessary and certainly George Jeffreys had those in abundance. Uh, the Lord, uh, the common sergeant could, of course, continue in practice as well as providing over cases, sitting often with the recorder of London and occasionally the Lord Mayor. Um, his friendship with city mer merchants certainly helped uh, him achieve the position. Now, I can mention people like Sir Robert uh, Clayton, who uh, made his money through uh, property development. He had a big house in Old Jury. He became a sheriff and ultimately uh, Lord Mayor of the City of London in 1689. Uh, Sir Thomas Budworth, another very wealthy merchant. Um, an alderman, Jeffreys, a distant cousin and uh, successful merchant. And also Robert, Robert Cornish, who was a, a, a banker and also successfully became uh, sheriff and, and Lord Mayor of the city. So it was it was important to have that sort of support and backing from city merchants. And it's also interesting to know that while they were they some of them had Whig sympathies at this time, that did not impede friendship or discharge of Jeffrey's role as common sergeant. Charles the second was uh, I think um, saw Jeffrey as an ideal candidate for common sergeant in the sense that he could provide the king with insights into the activities and affairs of the city of London at a time when the city was very protective of its own rights and 
the merchant class was growing in wealth and seeking to exercise their rights more extensively in, in, in concert with their rise, uh, the rise of trade and their very important growing fortunes. Another interesting event at the time, the Court of Alderman. Um, Jeffreys, in his role as common sergeant, was called upon to attend meetings of the Court of Alderman. This was at a time there was growing tension between the Court of Alderman and the Common Council due to the assertion of the Lord Mayors and the Court of Alderman that they had a right to veto the proceedings of Common Council. Jeffreys' independence in questioning the rights of the Lord Mayor and the Court of Alderman caused them to suspend him from office indeed. And Jeffreys appealed to the Privy Council who actually required him to appear before the King and apologise. And to quote George Keaton, the ruffled pride of city dignitaries having been appeased, the King recommended that the corporation restore Jeffreys to office, which they did after his apology. However, the incident probably caused him to be defeated when he was posed for office of Sheriff uh, of the Sheriff's Court in 1676, and also being passed over in 1676 in favour of Will William Dolbin's candidature for office of record of the City of London. I also mentioned briefly uh, a curious, the Muggleton trial. Um, as Common Sergeant, as I said, Jeffreys would sit with the recorder of the City of London and the Lord Mayor, and sometimes one or more of the judges of the King's Bench in criminal trials at the Old Bailey. Um, the most notable, let's say, criminal trial during this period was that of Ludovic Muggleton, a ranting religious fanatic, head of a sect known as the Muggletonians. Muggleton was convicted of publishing a blasphemous book. The punishment, three days in the pillory in separate locations in the city of London. His book was burnt. He had a 500 pound fine, pretty heavy fine monetarily, uh, harsh perhaps by the standards of the day. But the sentence was the collective decision of the court. Nevertheless, historian Macaulay focuses on Lord Jeffrey's role in it, even though more senior judges provided over the trial. Let me turn now briefly to his role as a recorder of the City of London. Um, he, he, sat, uh, he sat both as, uh, as a judge at the Old Bailey uh, with uh, the, um, the uh, uh, Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench and also sometimes at the Guildhall Courts. Let me talk briefly about his, one of the features of his time as recorder of the City of London some non-political cases. They varied from debauchery, uh, ravishing an existing uh, child of eight, to treason for tipping coinage, then a capital offence, and also to one stealing lead from church roofs. Times don't change. Uh, this, this is a rather amusing and curious case. While his language in the conduct of the trial of the uh, two people caught stealing lead from the church roof in Stepney, interesting enough, was vigorous. The sentence was by no means uh, uh, harsh. Uh, sentences of twenty pound each, with the comment to the uh, to the culprits: "Your zeal for religion is so great as to carry you to the top of the church. If this, if th if this, your way of uh, going to church, it is fit that you should be taken care of." A rather amusing uh, conclusion to the case. Perhaps one of the more important things, perhaps, was the growing opposition of the city and the Whigs. Um, growing opposition uh, uh, from uh, the Whigs resulted as, uh, elect from elections in the city, where the uh, position of the Whigs was in ascendancy. And as I said earlier, this was through the growing wealth of the merchants who wanted more legal power and authority for themselves and the city institutions. There's also professional envy as well as Whig antagonism. In 1680, Jeffreys was appointed to the Chief Dust Justiceship of Chester, which high in status was a part-time office of £500 a year. And at the time, Jeffreys retained, retained his recordership of the city and his practice at the bar. Others honours were bestowed on him and gave him precedence over colleagues in court. So additional, additionally, his rapid ascendancy at the bar caused envy, and the, the strong body of Whig supporters 
uh, created an environment that gave both professional envy, aided uh, and, uh, dare I say, uh, instigated by much of the Whig faction. One other uh, point to note in, in, in this film was the Popish plot. Um, it was a fictitious uh, conspiracy invented by Titus Oat. And between uh, 1678 and 1681, it gripped the kingdoms of the uh, England, Scotland in anti-Catholic hysteria. Um, George Jeffreys was uh, a member of the, uh, of the court at Titus Oates trial. And uh, Lord Jeffreys declared our nation was too long besotted and of innocent blood that, that, that too many much has been spilled. Let us have care for the future that we be not so suddenly imposed upon by such prejudices and jealousies as we have reason to hear such villains who have exercised too much uh, influence and filled our heads with a lot of tattle. That again did not uh, please um, those who were uh, opposed to, um, to, uh, to his uh, uh, role as recorder. His manner of departure was uh, uh, particularly uh, noted. Um, uh, they, there was a, 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 a bill called the um, Exclusions Bill, which wanted to exclude James II from the throne. Um, Lord Jeffreys uh, challenged that, uh, and uh, this angered merchants in the city, and uh, he actually resigned before they took a petition. Um, to Parliament. Uh, a rather sad uh, view, in my view, but they did, believe it or not, pay him £200 in recognition to his services at the conclusion of his term. Uh, let, me, let me go to some uh, concluding remarks, and if I could have the next slide with the Alden Ringby Church on it. Um, Lord Jeffreys, as I say, he went on to become Lord Chief Justice, and Lord Chancellor, and many of the observations which I've made in his role as Sergeant and Recorder of the City of London were reflected in his role as Lord Chief Justice and Lord Chancellor, but of course with much higher profile as one would expect. And there was increasing factiousness between the Whigs and the Tories, his close relationship with James II, who succeeded uh, uh, Charles II, uh, increased the antagonism. Jeffreys, of course, had a had a bad press through the bloody assizes, uh, the uh, the uh, where he had to uh, go and assist in the suppression of the Mont Rebellion. All accounts agree that uh, he played uh, what seems to us today an improperly large part in many trials. But since the law of the time did not allow the accused in such cases access to counsel, judge, the judge had to supervise both the prosecution and the defence and had to examine the witnesses. It was his duty to excavate the facts and present his discoveries to the jury. Jeffries was no worse, nor, be nor any better than other judges of the time. He was a servant of the king, the king demanded vengeance, and his servants had to supply it. During the Glorious Revolution, when James II fled the country, Jeffries stayed in London until the last moment being the only high legal authority in James's abandoned kingdom to perform political duties. When William III's troops approached London, Jeffreys tried to flee and follow the king abroad. He was captured in a public house in Wapping called the town of Ramsgate. Reputedly, he'd been disguised as a sailor and was recognized by a surviving judicial victim who claimed he could never forget Jeffreys' countenance, uh, particularly his ferocious eyebrows, which had by this time being shaven. Jeffrey was terrified of the public and uh, he was, when he was dragged to the Lord Mayor and imprisoned uh, in the Tower of London for his safety, he begged his captors for protection from the mob and uh, hoped that they would show him the same mercy that he had shown to others. He died, interesting enough, of kidney disease, which is a tribute to his alleged heavy drinking while in custody in the Tower of London in April 1689. And he was originally buried in the Chapel Royal of St. Peter and Vincula in the Tower. But in 1692, his body was removed to the church, which is on the slice, and 
Mary's alderman bread. And there's a final interesting postscript to this. Uh, St. Mary Aldermane Brie was uh, blitzed during the war and gutted by the German air raid, and all traces of Geoffrey's tomb were destroyed. Curiously, the remains of the church were transported to the United States in 1966. I think that was at the time when they also bought the, the London Bridge, which they thought was the um, Tower Bridge. But this church was re-erected in Fulton, Missouri, as a memorial to Winston Churchill. So there we are, some interesting insights and curiosities about Lord Jeffreys. I'd be very interested in any questions, comments that arise. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bob. These were obviously rumbustious times. Um, we have to say that the, uh, the Whigs and the Tories were at daggers drawn, sometimes literally, uh, in this period. And of course, the, uh, the Titus Oates plot was, um, was did prove to be bogus. But the Rye House plot, which came slightly later, 1683, a lot of people were executed. Uh, the philosopher John Locke had to flee to Holland for his own safety. And even dear old Samuel Pepys got himself into trouble. Uh, so this was a very, very difficult period. And it's quite interesting to see that, in fact, uh, Judge Jeffreys remained in his position of authority for quite so long, and perhaps without being as challenged as quite a lot of other people were. Um, and now a question is beginning to come in. Charles Vermont is asking, uh, what are the alternatives to the Whig version of history? The, the, the Whig version of history, um, you, you have to look at events in the context of the time, what the role was of, uh, of, of Lord Jeffreys and others. Um, the, the, the Whig view of history and uh, has been, um, uh, how shall I put it, um, uh, reviewed in the 20th century because things have not got successively better. One might talk about World War II. One might also talk of events afterwards. So we, 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 we are not uh, on our way to a, to, to a halcyon uh, paradise. I think the, the Whig view of history suited uh, the Victorian uh, narrative of the UK and its role in the world in, in Victorian times and perhaps up to the First World War. But uh, a number of historians have certainly come up with other views since then, and I'd be delighted to have a more uh, detailed technical uh, discussion with your the questioner subsequently. Yes, um, it is interesting, though, that uh, when individuals fell foul of the law, they really stood little chance. The notorious case is Stephen College, known as the Protestant joiner. Um, he actually did the panelling at Stationers Hall, which is why we still have his portrait of him. But he's the last man in England to be executed for sedition. And yes. he, he wrote he wrote scurrilous ballads about Charles II and the uh, Duke of York, as he was at the time. Uh, he was put on trial in London. And London, of course, had supported Cromwell during the Civil War and um, obviously let him off. Whereupon he was transported to Oxford, which had been royalist, a royalist stronghold during the Civil War, and that was where he was uh, condemned to death. Um, the other thing, of course, is that uh, the aftermath of the Civil War was very much in people's minds. Um, after the Monmouth Rebellion, um, there was a, the case of Lady Alice Lyle, who um, had been condemned for um, housing uh, Monmouth rebels, and uh, she was condemned to be burnt at the stake, and after some protest, uh, she was given the mercy of simply having her head cut off. But she was actually the wife of the regicide, Sir John Lyle, who had signed the death warrant of Charles I. And Charles II was absolutely implacable in his pursuit of, uh, of the, the regicides and some of the other leaders in the royalist armies. So we do have to bear in mind this is all well within living memory. And to a certain extent, given the rate of casualties and the total upheaval of the Civil War, it's almost surprising that there was as much stability as there was uh, during this period up to the glorious revolution of uh, 1688. By the way, I do have, um, thanks to Bob, I do have a copy of uh, the, uh, the Keating book. This is it. And uh, I went on to the, uh, to the uh, library at King's College and George Keaton, they don't just have this particular volume, they have pages of volumes by him. He was a prolific writer on, on matters of law. So I think that's a fairly important point as well. Um, sorry, Bob. Yes, 
I mean, I, I think the two most important points, I think, that hopefully emerge from uh, my lecture is one, um, that the judiciary were an organ or arm of the sovereign. Mm -hmm. And it was important uh, that they uh, uh, tried to help him effect stability in this rather tumultuous period, which you uh, rightly refer to between uh, 1660 mm -hmm. and the alleged glorious revolution. And also, the law was the law. Um, they were carrying out the law. And whether that was putting people in the in the pillory, uh, whipping them, or forms of capital punishment, that was the law, the rule of law, I'm afraid. Yes, and uh, I love the idea of the, uh, the judge being in charge of the defence as well as the prosecution. That would certainly speed trials up today, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> now... <laughs> Um, Charles, I want to come back with another question, actually. When do you believe the judiciary became independent of the monarch? Oh, um, I think that that actually didn't emerge till perhaps the um, 19th century. Yeah. Um, clearly, the, uh, the the Prince Regent had some, uh, George IV had some particular issues with, um, with the judiciary. But I, yeah. I think that emerged in... In Victorian times, and I suppose it was ultimately embodied in the what was it, the Remembering My History, the Judicature Act of 1873, which established broadly the current uh, uh, judicial structure we have today. There have been amendments mm -hmm. after that, but uh, that was, was it, yes, 18, 1873. I can't remember whether that was Disraeli or Gladstone, but no doubt mm -hmm. someone will put me right. But it, 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 it was finally consolidated at, at that time. Well, it certainly comes in after the Chartists. It's a kind of uh, period of modernisation, isn't it? Which is particularly right. interesting. But I do think that the key thing I said at the beginning, that it's rather odd to study the 17th century to learn something about today. But what it does demonstrate is that the judiciary, the executive and the legislature all seem to be mixed up together in this period because, of course, the Stuarts also believed in the divine right of kings. And <laughs> the... The case of Geoffrey shows the importance of keeping three branches of government completely separate, uh, even in the modern world, and even if this is uh, inconvenient of times. And uh, I think this actually is a topic which brings us uh, right up to date. Um, but uh, I must say that, uh, Bob, you've demonstrated a remarkable knowledge of the history of law in this country. And it's interesting to see that things um, have been as controversial in the past as they sometimes seem to be today. Um, I think that I, I think that's right, um, and but it, it, it gives I think a more objective and balanced uh, view of Jeffries, which, as I say, has really been subject to myth, legend, and folklore, uh, mm. which I attribute to uh, Lord Macaulay and uh, a number of other Victorian um, uh, historians, and unfortunately has been permeated through to the modern media. Yes, so uh, Shane Drennan's asking an interesting question about the extent to which our view of um, Judge Jeffries uh, is dictated now by current sensibilities. Are we analysing the past through the eyes of the present? Uh, uh, I, I think we most certainly are, and not only in this facet of history, but I think in many facets of history, we judge the past by our own contemporary morals, mm. values and standards. And people also say, of course, that history is written by the winners. I'm not quite sure who actually won in this particular period, but it does seem that, uh, as for many things, we need to be grateful to the uh, to the Victorians. Um, gosh, Charles, Charles Vermont comes write, up with a... Yes. Governments write their own history, Tim. <laughs> well, that as well. That's uh, something for the historians to discuss. Uh, Charles has come up with another one. Is the legal system during Jeffrey's time similar to the ones in current uh, vogue in China and Russia? Now, there's a question for you. That's an, that, that's an interesting observation. I don't, I, I don't know enough about them. But mm. if, if I believe the media, uh, what the media say, then yes, I suppose so. Perhaps at some point in the future, a George Keaton from Russia or China may, may put a different perspective on things. But that's for the future. Well, if George Keaton or um, his equivalents today uh, had this particular topic, I'm sure that Keaton himself would have had quite a lot to say. His volumes, I have to admit, are quite weighty, but I do look forward to reading the one you've lent me. Um, now, you. I'm afraid I, I don't think we have time for uh, more questions. So uh, we do have a number of lectures coming up and uh, let's have a look at those. So on Monday, 
Um, they're bang up to date and slightly different field. Capital is a powerful force for global impact. And I think this is interesting to look at this in the context of the City of London being a, a world force. We've got a lot of people signing up for the state of play with Fusion on the 30th of, of November. And then uh, an interesting angle on the matter of uh, the world's oceans on the 5th of December, the destruction of our undersea cultural heritage. Uh, that has some particularly interesting uh, aspects to it. I know later on in the year uh, we have uh, a lecture on the excavation of HMS Gloucester from the 18th century. And again, I think there's a surprising amount we can learn from the past simply by means of excavation. Um, in the meantime, of course, thank you very much to yourselves, the audience, for supporting the Lord Mayor's lectures. A great thanks to Bob McDowell. We're grateful for these new highlights into the background, not only of a key historical figure, but what I think is a key historic period. I often say to my American students, if you want to understand Britain today, you've really got to read the history of the 17th century. Now, um, the, this lecture, all our lectures are recorded and posted on the Gresham Society website, also on our YouTube channel, in case you'd like to revisit anything. And we hope to see you again soon for another lecture in the Knowledge Miles series. And don't forget the Mayor's theme for the year, which is Connect to Prosper. And I hope that we all do. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.